The Tolkien Road, Episode 50, The Silmarillion, Chapter 19, of Baron and Luthien, Part 1. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. It's our 50th episode, and it also just so happens to be the episode where we discuss chapter 19 of the Silmarillion of Baron and Luthien. It's an amazing chapter, an epic tale all by itself, so epic that we weren't able to cram it all into one episode. So this is part one with part two to follow next time. If you haven't read the story before, we hope you'll be inspired to do so by our conversation. And by the way, there's no better way to say congratulations on episode 50 than to pop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and feedback. It's easy to do, only takes a moment, and will make us ever so grateful. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. This is John. And Greta. What's up? What's up? Um... It's episode 50. Here Woo! we are. We made Man. it to 50 episodes. I feel like we need to have like a dance party or something. Well, it's a podcast, so we could, that wouldn't really, you know, yeah. be very productive. Well, um, I didn't mean that would be exactly a dance party, but the equivalent of what a dance party would be on a podcast. How about you have a dance party? Okay. And I'll watch. Right That's now? That's not good. Huh? Right now? Uh, no. We got a lot to talk about. That's true, we do. Uh, we're doing, okay. we are doing chapter 19 of The Silmarillion for the 50th episode. Um, it, it just so happened that this was, this was how it all kind of played out. I didn't pl- really plan this. Um, you know, I realized maybe a few episodes ago that it was probably going to work out this way. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's really cool so that it did awesome. because this is, this is such a huge story and, um, in the grand scheme of things when it comes to Tolkien. Um, both within, both just as a story itself, but also its significance to uh, to Tolkien's own life and um, and his you know his ethos, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the way he uh, you know that, that he tried to live his life, I guess you'd say. So um, it's really cool it worked out that way. Of course, there's some some thanks to that is the fact that I did several episodes of the podcast. Uh, where I read my book Tolkien's Requiem, which is about, oh, um, right. which is about Baron Luthien. Hey, by the way, have you read Tolkien's Requiem yet? Nope. But I will not, now that I've not, read Baron and Luthien. Yeah. I know how much I love it. I believe it when I see it. Mm-hmm. I believe I it when I I'll see it. I'll do it. Buy me a copy and I'll read it. Well, hey, you can pick it up at TrueMyths.org/slash/b-e-r-e-n. You can go there and it'll oh, take yeah? you to the place where you can buy it. Um, Wait, I'm you're, hoping... gonna, you're gonna make me pay for it? Huh? You make me pay for it? Heck yes. Yeah. It's messed up. I am totally going to make you pay for it. <laughs> Cash in. Um, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, you know, hopefully, hopefully at some point this year I'm going to get my act together and actually put it out, um, mm-hmm. along, along with some other books I'm kind of working on right now to along, along a similar theme. I'm working on kind of a, um, a trilogy, you know, so this, like, I'm working on my own little Tolkien book trilogy, books about um, some of Tolkien's works and, and other aspects of, uh, you know, of Tolkiendom, mm-hmm. you know, I guess you could say, uh, things Tolkien, uh, of a similar vibe to what Tolkien's Requiem, and I also hope that I can kind of go back and do a, maybe a, a revision of Tolkien's Requiem when I publish it finally, because, you know, the first time was kind of an experiment putting it out there. But anyway, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about of uh, Baron and Luthien. So Let's do it. But real quick, yeah, you you told me earlier today that, and I, I came home and asked you what you thought because this is your first time reading Baron and Luthien. Although you've yeah. heard me talk about it before, and I've read your thesis. Well, my thesis was about my Baron thesis wasn't Luthien. really about Baron and Luthien. Oh no, that was that paper you wrote for that yeah. conference. That's yeah. right. Okay, so I read that paper. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So. You have an idea of what it's about. You have an idea of what it's about. I know know that there's been some chapters you really enjoyed, some chapters that you weren't so fond of. In the Silmarillion? In the Silmarillion. Oh, yeah. And so I was worried that 
you were going to be like, oh, this was so long, it was so boring. But I came home and you were like, oh, this is great. You know? Yeah. It's like one of the best things I've ever read. Yeah. It really is. It's I mean, awesome. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It's a totally uh, standalone story. I, um, It's kind of a shame that maybe that Tolkien was never able to, you know, or never had like the thought to expand it into a standalone story all itself. Although, mm-hmm. although there is the, uh, there is the Lay of Lithian, which is like an uh, a long an epic poem that he wrote. That's basically it's mentioned in yeah, Baron and Luthien. Yeah, it's it's basically the story. It's the story of Baron and Luthien, but told in poetic, in form. poetic form. And so, it's pretty long, right? It's yeah. several thousand lines, which is really long for a poem. Um. I have not read it. I, you know, what did he write first, to. this or the poem, the the chapter? Or the um, poem? I think the poem was where, kind of, he, you know, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure exactly mm-hmm. how it all progresses, but I think the poem was his original vision. Okay. Um, and, you know, at some point he started kind of writing down a prose version of the story, right? Because okay. all these stories developed greatly over the course of his life. Yes. Um. All right, but uh, you know. In order to start off, uh, we got to start off like we always do here on the Tolkien Road. Mm-hmm. And that means haiku. Bring it. This is the uh, 50th episode version of the Tolkien haiku theme. There's nothing different about it. I was going to say, I was listening so closely. It's like, oh, did you extend it? The boom is louder. The boom is louder that yeah. time. If you listen really it. closely, you can hear me going. You can hear me going. Fiftieth anniversary of the Tolkien <laughs> or fiftieth episode. Of the <laughs> oh very, man, very we quiet. should have. You should have done that. <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Or you, maybe ah. you could have done that over the intro music. Yeah. But oh well. Too late now. Oh well. Um. Yeah. Okay, haiku time. Haiku so time. we have haiku from both Josh and Mary Grace this Woo-hoo, week. Super fans coming through. That's right. That's right. Representing. Um, well, I'll let. Uh, so Mary Grace wrote a special one just for the fact that it was the fiftieth. So I'll read that one first. It's, you oh. know, it's, it's not really about the story. Okay. Um, it says half halfway to one hundred. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Congrats, Cars Wells. So, Aw, that's sweet. That Thanks, is, Mary is. Grace. Thank you, Mary Grace. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So um, let's see who who goes first on haiku. This we time. gotta play rock paper rock, scissors. We gotta, we gotta play scissors paper rock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ready? Rock paper scissors shoot. Darn it! <laughs> Darn it! How many is that? That's like I'm like I've beat you like the last six or Whatever. seven in a row. Whatever. Man. Whatever. I, I think what? I just psych you out. I think I think you're like so psyched out about it at this point that you like you overthink it. You know? I probably do. I think if you just like went with the flow and yeah. like you just did whatever spontaneously happened. You're probably right. If I didn't think that's you, my problem is I overthink it. Your subconscious it. probably knows what the right answer is. Probably but does. Probably yep. it. But I'm an overthinker by nature, so yeah. well we both kind of my cross. Um, oh well. So who's going first? Uh I'll let you go first. Okay. My rope two. Okay. I think you should let me share both. That's fine. Because um, one I wrote like two minutes ago while you were introducing the show. Mm-hmm. And then the other one I kind of stole from Tolkien. So neither one of them are truly amazing. Mm-hmm. I can't take credit at least for the first one. But I like to share them both on account of it being our 50th episode. Yeah, I, you, be my guest. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to write, I'm going to read the one that I wrote like a second ago right now. Okay. Okay. Um, here it is. Till death do us part. Did not ring true for these two. Fearless, selfless love. Hmm. Nice. Good stuff. Thanks. Yeah, it literally like just came to me while I was watch- listening to you blab on about... I don't even know what you're blabbing on about because well, I was focused on my haiku writing. Lord only knows what he yeah. was blabbing on about. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to write haiku. Yeah, I try right here. Exactly. Nice. Um, no, I just got to thinking. It just kind of hit me. Like the whole death do us part thing mm-hmm. of marriage vows. I was like, wait. Baron and Luthien are probably like the only people ever that that 
that I know of. That that. Okay, never mind. Yeah. I'm about ready to tear apart my own haiku, and I don't well, want to do that. There is a yeah. There is George and Mildred just down the street. <laughs> they had a similar story. How did I forget about George and Mildred? Yeah, everybody knows about George and Mildred. Everybody knows about George and Mildred. That was, that was an amazing yeah. party they threw. Man, okay. That's right. All right, here's my other one. I shall go with you, and our doom shall be alike, in life or in death. Nice. Nice. He you drink a nice first two lines? I think that was like my my favorite line from Say the again? entire story. I kind of took it and twist. I like oh. rearranged it a little bit, but it's in a line. It's something that Luthien says to Baron. She says something in the fact with whichever road you take. I shall go with you, and our doom shall be alike. Oh. So I kind of took that. Yes. And it didn't work into a perfect haiku, so I had to mess with it a little bit. But it was, I shall go with you, and our doom shall be alike, in life or in death. Nice. So that's what I got. Well done. Thanks, yo. I like them. Thanks. Um, all right. Yours. Mine. Okay, here we go. Music made the world. The song of Tenuviel sets prisoners free. Oh. Mm. Well, good. Yeah, I like yeah, that one. I felt like it was good. very, very haikuish. It, it's, I felt like it captured the real spirit of haiku, which you know the the whole the whole spirit of haiku, as I understand it, is to like bring to. Is to kind of like unify two different ideas. Mm. Mm-hmm. And and to kind of give you a. Interesting. Worth contemplating, you know, kind of right. Kind of deal. Um, that's something I love about um, about especially the Silmarillion is the important role that music plays yes. in it yes. from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So yeah, music made the world. The song of Tenubiel sets prisoners free. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, well done. All right. So Mary Grace. Uh, Mary Grace Grace. sent me two for the chapter, so I'll read both of those. Sweet. The first one for Mary Grace. Oh, the happy fault that brought so much suffering and love for Baron. Oh, the happy fault. Yes. Oh, the happy fault that brought so much suffering and love for Baron. Mm, That's good. Yeah. I'm all about happy faults. Mm -hmm. Felix. Felix Culpa. Felix Culpa. Good old Felix. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. And then um, her second one is Luthien the Fair, Tenuviel, left immortality for love. Mm. Ooh, that gave me chills. Yeah. Left immortality for love. I gotta check some. I gotta have to look this up on Josh. Josh, so good job, Mary Grace. Josh yes. sent, sent a few. Beautiful, beautiful job. Um, I gotta check something on his because I'm not you sure. You gotta check something on Josh's? Yeah, well. He used a name that I think I know what it refers to, but um, I meant to look it up beforehand, and I, so I want to look it up right this second. Is it a Star Wars name? No. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. That's right. Apparently, yes. You were correct. Just as I, just as I presumed. <laughs> All right. So, the first one from Josh. Okay. Myron changes form. Who on two, both more feral, wolves stalk one another. That sounded really good, but I don't know. Myron changes form. Who on two, both more feral, wolves stalk one another. What was that second line? Both more feral. Oh, feral. Yeah. Got it. Okay, okay. I thought, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, so My, do you know who Myron is? He's a bad guy. Which bad right. guy? AKA better known as Sauron. Sauron, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was. Uh, I guess uh, that was his original name as a Maya was Myron. Myron. Yeah. And then he just changed the first letter, and now he's Sauron. Sauron. Sauron changed a little bit more than that. I but, know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, good job. Yeah, that was kind of creepy. And... Not like, form changing anything. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, 
The second one from Josh. Mm-hmm. Of jewels and wolves I sing, so too the elves, and he, dark servant, dark lord. Hmm. Of jewels and wolves I sing, so too the elves, and he, dark servant, dark lord. Nice. I like that. Mm-hmm. It's really, really good. Good stuff. Now I remember why I, I always go first. <laughs> Yours are good. Yours are good. Those are really great, guys. Thanks for yeah. sending them. Yeah. Everybody did a good job. We have enough participation trophies to go around. <laughs> so, you know. Okay. Not to crown the, the grand champion. All right. Um, if it's must be best way. Yeah. Haiku is not about competition, Greta. You know, actually, that's probably pretty much everything that Haiku is against. Mm-hmm. It's about peace and love and yeah. fuzzy, warm thoughts. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here we go. So, uh, Haiku time is over. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so a little bit, a little bit of background. There's. As I mentioned, this is a very important story to, to Tolkien, both... Um, it's a great story just in terms of the story itself, which we'll talk about plenty, but it's also an important story in Tolkien's own life. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to read from his letters, um, and there's more that could be said, but I'm going to read two very specific passages. One of them is from... Um, a 1955 um, letter to the Hufflin Mifflin Company. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this is in response to, I believe, some people writing in to the New York Times just after, you know, The Lord of the Rings was, this couple of years after The Lord of the Rings was published. Okay. And just trying to basically get more information from Tolkien on himself. And so at one point in this letter, um, and this is actually in the post postscript of the letter. Um, he says he's talking about the background of the Lord of the Rings, basically everything that happens in the ages before it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he says this business began so far back that it might be said to have begun at birth. Somewhere about six years old, I tried to write some verses on a dragon about which I now remember nothing except that it contained the expression "a green great dragon." and that I remained puzzled for a very long time at being told that this should be great green. But the mythology and associated languages first began to take shape during, the, during World War I. The fall of Gondolin and the birth of Arendelle was written in hospital and on leave after surviving the Battle of the Somme in 1916. The kernel of the mythology, the matter of Luthien, Tenubiel, and Baron, arose from a small woodland glade filled with hemlocks, or other white umbellifers, near Rus on the Holderness Peninsula, to which I occasionally went when free from regimental duties while in the Humber garrison in 1918. Um, hmm. So, uh, what I like about that is that he refers to the story, what I find interesting is that he refers to the story of Baron Luthien as the kernel of the mythology, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That it's kind of the, the like root the root of it yeah. all, yeah. right? Um, so, that's the first thing to know about Baron and Luthien is that Tolkien himself called this story the kernel of the whole mythology. It's like a right? foundation. Yeah, it was yeah. like the little seed from which the rest of Middle Earth sprung. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because it's apparently not the first thing, not the first story that he wrote that he eventually incorporated into it, but it may, because he, you know, he mentions a couple of other stories that he had already kind of started thinking about. But it seems like maybe this was the story that started to bring it all together for him and, mm. and where he started to think about creating something that was all part of one uh, part so of the world. So you think he wrote this? He wrote Baron Luthien as one of the... Is that where the first thing he wrote as part of the Silmarillion? It's one of the first things he wrote. One of the first things he wrote. Yeah, one of the first okay. things he wrote. Um, the story, right, the story itself, not... not Necessarily, as it's exactly right, right, right. is it's here. Kind of the general framework, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, that's something that's something to keep in mind, and um, uh, and then there's this bit um, in a letter he wrote in nineteen 
uh, January 24th, 1972, to Michael, one of his sons. And this was just after... Um, this was this was just after um, Edith Tolkien died, his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, upon whom, well, I'll just read the I'll just read the passage. I met the Luf- the Luthian Tenubiel of my own personal romance with her long dark hair, fair face, and starry eyes and beautiful voice. And in 1934, she was still with me and her beautiful children. But now she has gone before Baron, leaving him indeed one handed. But he has no power to move the inexorable Mandos, and there is no Dor Girth Echunar, the land of the dead that live, in this fallen kingdom of Arda, where the servants of Morgoth are worshipped. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, Edith herself was somewhat of the inspiration for Luthien, for mm-hmm. Tenubiel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can even see it in the description, because she... Um, you know, she had dark hair, mm-hmm. um, and of course, Luthien Tenubiel is, has dark hair. Mm-hmm. Um, so, this was a story that meant quite a bit to Tolkien uh, on a personal level. Yeah. So much so that on their tombstone, right, they have a shared tombstone, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. you know, the basically there's not much written on there except for their names, and then uh, Baron and Luthien, right, for uh, for J.R.R. and for Edith, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think that's so cool, though, because of what happens in the story mm-hmm. and the fact that, you know, they are tied so closely together, but also um, that they experience a resurrection, you know, at the same time, right? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, but anyway, I, I want to give that background. We're going to talk about the story and, and all that good stuff. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. The other, the one other thing I'll point out is, in, in for background, is that in the preface to the Silmarillion, which is actually one of the letter, part of one of the letters, um, he talks, you know, he talks a great length about um, kind of a setting the stage for the Silmarillion. And on in my copy on page XVII, Roman numeral seventeen. Um, he says, The chief of the stories of the Silmarillion, and the one most fully treated, is the story of Baron and Luthien, the elf maiden. Here we meet, among other things, the first example of the motive to become dominant in hobbits, that the great policies of world history, the wheels of the world, are often turned not by the lords and governors, even gods, but by the seemingly unknown and weak, owing to the secret life and creation, and the part unknowable to all wisdom but one. That besides that resides in the intrusions of the children of God into the drama, it is Baron the outlawed mortal who succeeds, where all the armies uh, and with I'm sorry with the help of Luthien, a mere maiden, even if an elf of royalty, where all the armies and warriors have failed, he penetrates the stronghold of the enemy and wrests one of the Silmarilli from the Iron Crown. Thus he wins the hand of Luthien, and the first marriage of mortal and immortal is achieved. Um. So here we have, you know, again, we have Tolkien giving pride of place to this story, right? Mm-hmm. This, he says the chief of the stories of the Silmarillion is the story of Baron and Luthien. Yep. And, it's, and it really gets to the heart that he would develop more fully when it came to hobbits. That the, This idea that it's really not the great powers of the world that drive the history of the world. Um, but that there's this secret the secret something deep down um, that causes that every once in a while, you know, or, or maybe all the time causes the little people who nobody really thinks are going to do much to actually be the powerful ones. Right. Mm-hmm. And in a way that's, that's a very strong theme of this, of this story. Yeah. I totally get that. Um, it's, it's troubled me because I've tried to write quite a bit about this and, it's difficult to put into words, you know, exactly what he's saying here. Um, especially, especially without coming off trite or, or not quite getting the power of what he's really saying mm-hmm. there. Um, mm-hmm. cause it's not just about an underdog story. It's about, um, it's, it's about this, it's about this true poetry and it's about this downfall of the prideful and the powerful, right? Mm-hmm. That the, the, the powerful who are full of their own power, Right. Um, 
and the recognition that it's it's not that's that's not true and lasting power yeah that's not true and lasting greatness right right? yep um okay so you ready to start talking about the story itself i thought you never asked all right sorry i know i'm just blabbing on okay um so we pick up where we left off with chapter 18 and uh things have gone pretty bad for the free peoples of beleriand Yes. Right, you remember yes. we had the Battle of Sudden Flame. Yeah. Um, the yep. armies there on the plain just outside of Angband uh, were driven away. The siege was broken, and the forces of Morgoth start to spill out into Beleriand and cause a lot of trouble. Yep. Um, the House of Beor, the, the descendants of Beor, the one of the first um, Edain, one men. of the first great men. Yeah. Um, they really, man, they 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 get hurt bad, they, right? They get walloped. And there's only twelve, 12 left. Yeah, twelve men left, and it's kind of this band of outlaws at this at the beginning. Yeah. Um. And so, um, Barahir is the leader of this band, um, and Barahir is the father of Baron. Right. Now it picks up, and they're um, they're kind of you know. Trying to trying to stay, um, you know, trying to stay on the down low. Um, they, they're they're attacking where they can, but they're really trying to stay on the down low because they're wanted men. Right. Um, and uh, Morgoth is getting really annoyed with these guys, and so he sets Sauron, his his chief henchman, you know, to to make something happen and to um, you know to really get these guys. Right. Um, and. What happens next is Gorlam, right? Gorlam, the unhappy, right? Yes. So, what? Tell me about old Gorlam as you understand it. Um. So, Gorlam. Yeah. Was um, he came back from war mm-hmm. to find his home destroyed, his wife gone, mm-hmm. and he wasn't sure if she. had been captured or killed. Right. So as you can imagine, anybody coming home to this situation mm-hmm. would be quite unhappy. Right. Right? And it says that he and his, his, the, the, his and his wife's love was great. Like, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I think they were, they were pretty tight. Yeah. 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 They had a very special, special relationship. And so, he, because he's not sure that she's dead or not, he goes out and looks for her. Mm-hmm. Right, and this one night he goes back to his house that's been ruined, and he thinks he sees a light on, and he sees his wife. Right, and um, and so he he cried out to her, right, and mm-hmm. then um, and he he tries to go get her, right, but it turns out that it was just a nasty trick, yeah, on Sauron's part using his evil wicked wicked wizardry to. To produce this effect, and it turns out his wife is indeed dead. Right. And right. so this is how Sauron captures Gorlam. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, and 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 he does. He sees Ilanel. I mean, he it says he says um, he saw Ilanel, and her face was worn with grief and hunger. Right. It wasn't really her. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't her. really her. But I'm just saying that he, it's that he does actually like see her face, even though. It's not really her face, you know. What I'm saying? It's not like well, he. It wasn't like, it's not he like wasn't he, hallucinating. It's not like he just sees a light on, right? right. And yeah, it yeah. thinks, oh, maybe she's in there. Like, right. like Sauron is actually playing a very vicious trick. Right, a very vicious there. trick. Yeah. Right. The, um, yeah. So he goes and tries to get to her, and then Sauron captures him. Right. Um, and unfortunately, Gorlim is so, you know, just worn out. And and Gorlim was a, you know, he was. He was a great warrior, you know, but he's worn out and, you know, as, as anyone probably would be at this point. Right. Um, he's, he's war weary, you know, he, he thinks his, all of the people he loves are dead, yeah. um, including his wife and his children. And, you know, at some point it's just like, man, how can you go on? You know, yeah. what do you have um, to live for? especially okay. for mortal men, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. um, and so, when Sauron comes along and says, um, "Hey, what what's your price, basically, for 
uh, you know, in order... he wants to find the outlaws. Yeah, in order to find the outlaws. Right. Um, uh, and Gorlam says, I just want to be with Island L again. Mm-hmm. And Sauron says, well, then I can help you with that. He said, that's actually a small price to pay, yeah. right? Yeah, I can make that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and even then, Gorlam initially is like, oh, I don't know about this. This is Sauron we're talking about. But Sauron, mm-hmm. it says he was daunted by the eyes of Sauron. Yes. Um, and he told at last all that he would know. So he's weakened in this weakened state. Um, uh, and then Sauron laughs and says, oh, yes, I will grant your prayer. Uh, even though Ilanel is dead, I will still grant your prayer. Mm-hmm. And he put him cruelly to death is what it says. So yeah, it's just like strike. He says, yeah, I will grant your prayer. I'll put you with Ilanel. Or yeah. Ilanel again. I'll kill you so you can right. be with her. Um, so... Yeah, Sauron shows himself to be a really nasty dude right yeah. from the get-go in this chapter. And I'm using your copy with the notes in it. And yeah. right there in that part, I think the note you have in there says, Messed up. That's right. Boy and Seth. That's probably the clean, sanitized version of what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Dang, yo, that's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. I mean, it is. It's really... It's, it's very, it's, very It's vicious, evil. cruel. Very, yeah, every, yeah, every word you like that you can think of. Yeah. So, but now Sauron and his minions know how to find Barahir and mm-hmm. his men. And yeah. so they, they go about finding them. And, and um, even then, Baron is off on his own briefly. Um, maybe he's off. He's away when Sauron right. and his minions strike, right? Right. Um, he'd been sent on a perilous errand to spy upon the ways of the enemy, and he was far afield when the lair was taken. And he's warned in a dream by the ghost of Gorlam, right, mm-hmm. to flee. You know, this is going to happen and to, and to try and warn his father, but he's too late. Yes. He's too late. And so Baron is on his own now. Mm-hmm. Now, one important thing before, before Baron is really, you know, you know, leaves the scene and everything, he does go and attack the people who just killed. So he kind of sneaks up on the orcs that ambushed. Right. Um, his father and, mm-hmm. and you know and, and his father's companions. Yep. Uh, and he does manage to get the ring of Felagund, right? Do you remember what that was? Mm, was that what he he gave to um, as a token of like his friendship and because um, what was his name? Bayor was like his right hand man, right? He went with. No, no, no. So, so remember last chapter, Bara here. Saved Felagan Fenrod's life, right? And when, when during the Battle of Sudden Flame, when Fenrod was surrounded, oh, Barahir came right. back again and, right. and saved oh, his okay. life. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so Felagan you know, right, gave right. him this ring as a token of basically right. saying, you know, my life is, uh, you know, my life is yours, right? right. Um, yes. When you need it. Yes. So he does manage to get this ring, um, and then he escapes into the, the wild. Because the orcs had stolen it. Is that? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. He had cut off his. Dad. They just cut yeah. off. They that's just right. cut off his hand, and and they were going to take it as a token back to Sauron. Right. right. But he but manages. Gets it back. He manages okay. to get it back. Um. All right. So. Um. So Baron goes about wandering in the wilderness and does many great deeds, and word of his, um, you know, greatness starts to spread around, and he's a real pain. Uh, pain in the rear for Morgoth and for Sauron. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and so he's, you know, he's here. Um, and his, the ta- I'm sorry, the tales of his story come even to Doriath, right? Um, but he's in this kind of um, crazy land up there between Doriath. If you look back in the, on the map in the back. Um, and you look, you know, in the center there, if you look at Doriath and Dorthonian, um, uh, and then right up here, um, at the arid, arid Gorgoroth, Mm -hmm. you know, he's kind of hunt, he's kind of in this area right here, right in this wilderness up here. Um, Ah, right. And, uh, and somehow he came stumbling, he comes stumbling into Doriath, Right. Um, tired, um, beat up, gray and bowed as with many years of woe, so great had been the torment of the road. Um, 
So this is the one that we he is the one that we that they mentioned right in the last chapter about how even the girdle of Melian would not be able to keep him out. Yeah, is it says correct? it says, and he passed through the mazes that Melian wove about the kingdom of Thingol, even as she had foretold, for a great doom lay right. upon him. Right. So, so something about this guy. Um, Something about this guy seems uh, charmed. He's able to pass through things, you know, to find his way through things that others yes. aren't. Um, he's he's been picked out for something great. Yes. Um, even though he probably doesn't feel that way right now, mm-hmm. uh, he probably feels like he's been picked out for something pretty rotten. Yeah. But he comes stumbling into Doriath, and that's when he sees Luthien. Mm-hmm. Um, wondering in the summer, why don't you read this? So um, on one sixty five, uh, just start where it is told. And then, uh, I'll maybe just read that first, read that paragraph, and okay. we'll see if we want to go further. It is told in the lay of Lithian that Baron came stumbling into Doriath Gray and bowed, as with many years of woe, so great had been the torment of the road. But wandering the summer in the woods of Neldoreth, he came upon Luthien, daughter of Thingol and Melian. At a time of evening under moonrise, as she danced upon the unfading grass in the glades beside Escalduin. Then all memory of his pain departed from him, and he fell into an enchantment, for Luthien was the most beautiful of all the children of Iluvatar. Blue was her raiment as the unclouded heaven, but her eyes were gray as the starlit evening. Her mantle was sewn with golden flowers, but her hair was dark as the shadows of twilight. As the light upon the leaves of trees, as the voice of clear waters, as the stars above the mists of the world, such was her glory and her loveliness. And in her face was a shining light. Um, Keep going, read that next paragraph. But she vanished from his sight, and he became dumb, as one that is bound under a spell, and he strayed long in the woods, wild and weary as a beast, seeking for her. In his heart he called her Tenubiel, that signifies Nightingale, daughter of twilight in the gray elven tongue, for he knew no other name for her. And he saw her afar as leaves in the winds of autumn, and in winter as a star upon a hill, but a chain was upon his limbs. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, he comes into Doriath and he is just beat up and bruised and broken. And he sees, he sees Tenubiel, he sees Eleuthian, uh, who is the most beautiful of all the children of Iluvatar. And, um, and it's like, you know, it's like he's gazing upon heaven, yes. heaven on earth, yes. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Sorry. that's okay. Um, and so it's kind of a balm for him, but at the same time she disappears and, and does he, like, he puts, does she actually put him under a spell or is that just how entranced he is by her? Cause it's like, he can't move, he can't talk, like he's like. That's a good question. Uh, it just says that, uh, he became dumb as one that is bound under a spell and he strayed long right. in the woods. So as, as one, it doesn't say he is actually under a spell. Right. Okay. And he, he's the one that gives her the name Tenuviel, which is, you know, signifies Nightingale, mm-hmm. you know, daughter of twilight. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and, and, and just a quick reminder, um, Luthien, you know, being the most beautiful of the children of, of all the children of Luvatar, she is, of course, the daughter of an elf, great elf king, and a Maya, yeah. right? A Maya. She's got good genes. Yes. So, you know, you could argue she's got um, something like divine, you know, I mean, she's the only, uh, she's the only creature ever to be like that, right? Yes. In the In the entire yes. mythology of Tolkien mm-hmm. that we know mm-hmm. of. Um, you know, to, to have both the, to be descended both from uh, an immortal elf and also, but also from one of the Ainur, yes. really, right? Yeah. Yeah. One of the minor Ainur, but you know, nevertheless, so, one of the Ainur, one of the one of those yeah. who was there at the very beginning mm-hmm. when, you know, during the during the music of the Ainur. So that's important. Um, keep in mind. Yes. So she's very beautiful. She sets she sets a, um, you know, she she's both a balm and painful to Baron because he sees her and then she's gone, mm-hmm. and 
and so he's he's wondering, you know, like just stumbling about, like where did she go? Where did she go? Um, and and then she sings again, and it said, and she comes again and and dances upon a green hill, and this makes me think exactly of what Tolkien was talking about when back in nineteen seventeen or nineteen eighteen with Edith, you know, and his inspiration for the. Um, for the song, right? Oh, uh, okay. And the um, and the groves of hemlock, or you know, whatever it was that, uh, whatever flower it was. I right? yes, okay. And suddenly she began to sing. Keen, heart piercing was her song. It's the song of the lark that rises from the gates of night and pours its voice among the dying stars, seeing the sun behind the walls of the world. And the song of Luthien released the bonds of winter, and the frozen waters spoke, and flowers sprang from the cold earth where her feet had passed. Uh, then the spell of silence fell from Baron. He called to her, crying, Tenuviel, and the woods echoed the name. And that when she when he calls that name, it's like she he's calling her a name that she's always had, but you know, but she never knew. And mm-hmm. it's like you know, it's almost like this you know this identity that uh, that only he could have given her. You know, huh. um, it just it just kind of makes me think of that. Yeah. Um, then she halted in wonder and fled no more, and Baron came to her. But as she looked on him, doom fell upon her, and she loved him. Yet she slipped from his arms and vanished from his sight, even as the day was breaking. Um, and Baron once again is like, "Oh, where did she go? Where did she go?" Um, Man, we talk about a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, he groped as one stri- that is stricken with sudden blindness and seeks with hands to grasp the vanished light. Thus he began the payment of anguish for the fate that was laid on him. And in his fate, Luthien was caught, and being immortal, she shared in his mortality, and being free, received his chain. And her anguish was greater than any other of the Eldalier has known. So Baron first feels this pain, but then Luthien looks upon Baron and loves him back, right? Right. And her, and the chain of his mortality falls upon her she looks upon him and sees and knows he's a man knows he's mortal and she realizes um that you know if she if she follow if she gives her heart to him you know she's going to be ensnared in that same mm-hmm. in that same fate mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um even if she, even if somehow she was able to keep her mortality her immortality you know she would still suffer the pain of of his death right 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 yes um so, uh, let me do a quick time check here. I think it's a good time to take a commercial break. We need to, we need to huddle up because we're not very far in, um, figure out <laughs> how far we're going to go. So I thought, I thought this might happen, but, um, I it's just such, it it's, this is such a dense, like so much of the film really, it's such a dense yeah. chapter. Yes. It's um, a long chapter and it, there's, yeah, and it's dense too. It's long and dense. Yeah. So this one might take more than, more than one episode. So we're going to pause. Take a quick commercial break, huddle up, and we'll let you know what the plan is when we get back. Yeah, so, so don't go away. Don't go away. Hey, 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 Tolkien Roadsters. What's shaking? Greta Carswell here, just getting my groove on to the Tolkien haiku theme music. Man, that's an awesome song. You know what else is awesome? Feedback on the Tolkien Road on iTunes. Oh yeah, you heard me right iTunes feedback is one of the best ways you can tell the world about your undying love for this podcast, because it lets those knuckleheads at Apple know that the Tolkien Road is where it's at. I mean, come on, why didn't they know that already? Am I right? So next time you're waiting in line to pick up some delicious tacos, surfing the World Wide Web, brushing up on a Tom Bombadil factoid, or keeping it real in whatever way you keep it real, pop on over to iTunes and let the human race know what you think about the Tolkien Road. We're all dying to know for reals. Party on, y'all. All right. Well, we are back. Back, back, back. And we huddled, we done huddled up, and we decided where we're going to, that we need to definitely not try to get through the whole thing in one episode. This yes. would be a, a marathon episode if we try to do that. So, um,. We picked a kind of stopping point that we think would be good, so we're going to spend the rest of this episode trying to get there, and then we'll finish out the chapter in the next episode. Okay, so at this point, um, Luthien, uh, it says, Being free received his chain. She shared in his mortality. 
um, and her anguish was greater than any of the any other of the El Dalier has known. Um, so she makes a choice to give herself to Baron and share in his mortality. Yes. Right. Um, and and so you know again beyond his hope she returned to him where he sat in darkness and long ago in the hidden kingdom she laid her hand in his. Um, and thereafter often she came to him and they went in secret through the woods together from spring to summer and no others of the children of Iluvatar have had so great uh, have had joy so great though the time was brief um, and so they, they're kind of doing this you know little um, meeting in the woods kind of thing in secret mm -hmm. for a while it sounds like um, mm -hmm. and um, you know they're, they're this has got to be very nice for Baron Right after oh, sure. after all the time wandering in the wilderness, being a wanted man, yes. now he's in this protected area mm -hmm. uh, where no orcs can come, and he finds the most beautiful woman ever. Right, mm -hmm. and so he's there in uh, in the woods, and in, you know basically they have each other all to themselves. Yes. Right, and yeah. no one else knows about it. But unfortunately, there's this can fellow. Yeah, you go ahead. Quick. I think it's really. I really liked how um, Tolkien here, um, he, he you know, makes the point that, that um, Luthien's anguish, her heartache was greater than any other, uh, you know, any of her race had known. Right. But then just a f couple sentences later, he says, yes, but her joy was yes. also greater than yes. any of them. So, you know, it's kind of that, you know, it's that whole... Um, you know, it's that whole idea of, um, you know, that, that, that from great suffering, jo great joy can mm -hmm. result, mm -hmm. right? That they're, that they're not mutually exclusive, that they, they can, you know, it's almost the great joy is what makes that great suffering bearable. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of paradoxes, you know, seeming yes, paradoxes, paradoxes like that that yes. go on in this chapter. Yes. Um, uh, um, I had one. I had one on the tip of my tongue, and now it escapes me. Um, but there's a lot. There's a lot of language in this chapter, like similar to that. I saw one too. Where was it? Um, you know, just stuff like her. Ang you know, her anguish was greater than any of the other El Dalia is known, which you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. There was. Beyond his hope, she returned to him where he sat in darkness. So, mm -hmm. you know, Probably Baron at this point, you know, yeah. is, is apparently before she returns him is in despair, you know, mm -hmm. even greater despair than before. Yes. Um, but then she returns and it, and it fills him, you know, it fills him with life and mm -hmm. uh, once again with joy. So, um, so we have Darren. The minstrel. Yes. Daron the min uh, let me make sure I'm saying that right. We got A E Dyron. Is that how I should be saying it? I don't know. You probably should have figured this out. I probably should have. I always get in trouble with this kind of stuff. Um as in A E but A may be pronounced in the same way as A I and O E as in English. Toy. But as AI. Sorry. Sorry, just checking this out. Yeah, it's so it should be. It should be Dyron. 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 Dyron the minstrel. Also loved Luthien. So Dyron. Dyron is um, a minstrel in the house in the in the court of, at the court of Thingle, and he gets wind of. Of what's going on because he has he has the hots for Luthien, mm -hmm. right? He like he loves Luthien as well. Mm -hmm. I figure probably lots of, you know, the elf elf men of Thingol's realm probably, yeah, probably you know, felt this way. Yeah, yeah probably yeah. felt this way about Luthien. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and he he figures out that there's this man in the woods that Luthien is going to see. Um, yep. So what does he do? What does any jealous guy do in this situation? He says, I'm happy for you kids. <laughs> Unless they be <laughs> wrong. Rats him out. He rats him out. He betrays them to Thingol. Um, 
the king is filled with anger, um, and for he loves Luthien above all things, mm-hmm. um, setting her above all the princes of the elves, whereas mortal men he did not even take into his service. Now, this is going to be a big deal in this chapter. Thingol does not like non-elves. Right. Thingol, uh, at different points, is nasty to the dwarves. At other points, he's nasty to men. Yes. And he's like, I don't want any of those men around my my realm. Right. You know, he 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 looks down upon uh, other races. Yes. Right. Um, I, I I hesitate to say that uh, he's racist because that has such modern connotations, but kind of fits, right? He's kind of a supremacist. He he is. He's an elf yeah. supremacist, yeah, he right? Is. Yeah. Um, kind of a jerk, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Big time jerk, actually. Yeah. Uh, is as great a as great a leader as he may be, he's a big time jerk. And what's ironic about all this, though, is that here he is, like, um, you know, looking down on mortal men, and especially this, you know, going to be this particular mortal man who, uh, you know, wants the hand of his daughter, you mm-hmm. know, the elf, his elvish daughter, and he doesn't think to himself, like, wait a minute. I'm an elf, a child of a Luvatar, and I took for my wife um, an Ainur, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. someone of really of greater race than I yeah. am, yeah. you know, far yeah. greater race than I am. That's true. Um, so there's a deep, there's a deep irony in all of this, right? There's a deep hypocrisy on on yeah. Thingol's part, you know. Um, calling the kettle black. Exactly. Um, just the fact that he won't, he won't recognize, he won't give. Any man, any man, the chance, right? right. Uh, she would reveal nothing about the whole thing when she, when Thingol confronted Luthien. Um, in, but so he swears an oath that he will neither slay Baron nor imprison him. But finally, he gets his servants to lay hands on Baron um, and brings him into brings him into Menegroth to the Thousand Caves, where his palace is within Doriath. Right. And so he starts to question him. Mm-hmm. And Luthien really starts speaking on his behalf. Right. Uh, he goes to speak. And he says, My fate, O king, led me hither. Through perils such as few, even of the elves, would dare. And here I have found what I sought not indeed, but finding I would possess forever. For it is above all gold and silver and beyond all jewels. Neither rock nor steel nor the fires of Morgoth, nor all the powers of the elf, elf kingdoms, shall keep from me the treasure that I desire. For Luthien, your daughter, is the fairest of all the children of Aluva, is of all the children of the world. Um, and these you know these words are uh, pretty powerful words. They cause silence. And what's interesting though is he says this is that he had looked as right before he said this, he had looked uh, into the face of Melian and it's almost like Melian inspired these words in him because it yeah. says Yeah it seemed that the words were put into his mouth when he looked at yeah. her. So maybe Melian's on his side. Yeah. No, I mean, I think she is, mm-hmm. right? I think I think she understands that, you know, as much as she probably loves Thingol, that he's kind of a fool in certain ways. He's and being he's, a little unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that he's, he, he may be standing in the way of some greatness that mm-hmm. both Baron and their daughter, Luthien, yes. are called to. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, uh, so silence falls upon the hall and some thought that Baron would be slain um, and Thingol says death you have earned with these words and death you should find suddenly had I not sworn an oath in haste of which I repent base born mortal who in the realm of Morgoth has learnt to creep in secret as his spies and thralls um, and Baron does not like these words he says death oh, you man, can give his, me unearned go ahead. his response is awesome Yeah, go ahead. I love his response Go ahead. Want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Then Baron answered, Death you can give me, earned or unearned. But the names I will not take from you of baseborn, nor spy, nor thrall. By the ring of Feligan that he gave to Barhir, my father, on the battlefield of the north, my house has not earned such names from any elf, be he king or no. Yeah. Awesome. I know, right? <laughs> I'll be like, booyah. That's right. Take that, Thingle. Yeah. Um, and he really has no words. Like, he's... 
you know, he's like, whoa. Yeah. I didn't expect that to come out of your mouth. Um, so Thingol, you know, is, is a little bit uh, taken aback right here. Yep. Um, and Melian leans to Thingol's side and whispered, um, told him basically to calm down, not to let his wrath get the best of him. And she says to him words that are kind of consoling for Thingol at least, but maybe not um, very consoling for anybody else. For not by you shall Baron be slain, and far and free does his fate lead him in the end. Yet it is wound with yours. Take heed. Right? So yeah. his his fate is bound up with yours, Thingol. Right. His fate is bound yeah, up with right. yours. So he's basically tread lightly here. Right. Yeah. Um, Thingol, I see the ring, son of Bara here, and I perceive that you are proud and deem yourself mighty, but as father's deeds, even had his service been rendered to me, avail not to win the daughter of Thingol and Melian. See now, I too desire a treasure that is withheld. For rock and steel and the fires of Morgoth keep the jewel that I would possess against all the powers of the elf kingdoms. Yet I hear you say that bonds such as these do not daunt you. Go your way, therefore. Bring to me in your hand a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown. And then, if she will, Luthien may set her hand in yours. Then you shall have my jewel. And though the fate of Arda lie within the Silmarils, yet you shall hold me generous. Um... So this is kind of... Go ahead. I was going to say, so he wants a Silmaril. Yeah. Yeah, that's the price for my daughter's hand. Right. Yeah. Right. And... Go ahead. I'm about ready to probably move on to something else. Well, I was just going to say, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in this in this here. Because first we have a few paragraphs earlier, Thingol mentioned, you know, I swore an oath in haste. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to get my hands on you. I swore an oath to my daughter in haste mm-hmm. that I wouldn't harm you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, what's the big haste... When we think of hasty oaths, what do we think of in the Silmarillion? Who, what was the hastiest of all oaths taken? Oh, Fanor. Yeah, Fan, the yeah. oath of Fanor and his sons, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, it bound, you know, it bound them to the everlasting darkness if they don't, mm-hmm. you know, if they don't recover the Silmarils, right? Um, so here you have more hasty oaths being taken. Yes. Oaths taken in anger, right? Yeah. Um, and not really well thought through and, you know, to say like, is this something, is there a good, really a good reason to take this oath? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's bound up, it's bound up with pride and, uh, and with all these other, um, you know, character flaws. Right. So the other thing though, is that um, as precious as Luthien is to Thingol, you know, think about this. He's basically saying, and, and true, the Silmarils in the context of this story are the most precious of all jewels there are, right? Yeah. They contain the light of the two trees, mm-hmm. the only remnant of that light left. And this was apparently some great holy light that, you know, that there was just something blessed about this light and to look upon it was, you know, um, something of like a religious experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but even so, as precious as his daughter is, the fairest of all the children of Iluvatar, um, he's basically comparing her life, the word, the value of her life to the yeah. Silmaril in this yeah. oath, right? Yeah. The value of, of her to the value of the Silmaril, right? So, again, we start to see another character flaw with Thingol where it's, you know, it's not just that he's he's got this... Elf, you know, his elf supremacist, as we'll put it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but he's also uh, he's also got the same uh, jewel lust, right? That like yeah. Morgoth had, and right. that Fanor and his sons had, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That he's got to have the jewels, right? Right. Um, so, uh, well, don't you think part of it may be too, though, that that but if I mean, it's obviously a challenge to Baron, right? And so. I mean, do you, don't you think that maybe part of it is that he is wants Baron to prove himself worthy of her hand? Yeah. I mean, maybe the Silmaril is, you know, obviously Silmaril is an amazing prize, but if he were to be successful, then he would have accomplished something that no one else mm-hmm. has been able to, right? And that would show Thingol that, okay, maybe mm-hmm. this guy is worthy of my daughter. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. 
Like, I know the Silver Rolls the ultimate prize. I'm not saying he doesn't have Jewel less, but I think that this is also a means for him to evaluate Baron's character. I think you're giving I think you're giving Thingol too much credit. credit. Okay. Well, and I I think in, if it weren't for what happens just a few paragraphs later, I think there would be you know that would be a fair a fairer assessment. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I definitely see where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, but a couple of paragraphs later, Melian says, "O King, you have devised cunning counsel. But if my eyes have not lost their sight, it is ill for you whether Baron fail in his errand or achieve mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. For you have doomed either your daughter or yourself." And now is Doriath drawn within the fate of a mightier realm. And then Thingol answers and says, I sell not to elves or men, those whom I love and cherish above all treasure. And if there were actually hope or fear that Baron should come, ever come back alive to Menegroth, he should not have looked again upon the light of heaven, though I had sworn it. Right? What does he say right there? He says, I sent him on an errand that I know he won't survive. Right. 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 Um, this is my way of getting rid of him. Right. So I promised I personally wouldn't kill him, so this is my way of making sure he gets killed. But think about that in light of what happened at the very beginning of the chapter, right? With Gorlam and Sauron, mm. right? And how evil Sauron was in setting up, you know, basically saying, you can have your wife mm-hmm. if you'll tell me what I need to know, mm. right? And now, now Dingle does Aaron, the same thing. You can have my daughter. Right. If you return from this death trap. Right. You know, mm-hmm. in order to accomplish... So this is not some... Like, I am the great king, and I'm sending you, young upstart, in a test to test your metal and see if you're worthy of my daughter, yeah. right? Yeah. It sounds like that at first, but this is... Thingol has devised a plot to get rid of Baron that he thinks there's no way he can survive. So right? then does he really want the Silmaril? If he doesn't think Baron's going to come back, then he doesn't think he's going to get the Silmaril either. Oh, yeah, he wants the Silmaril. Well, I know, but I'm saying, if he knows that Baron's... Not, if he believes that Baron will not succeed, then he knows he's not getting the Silmaril. So I yeah, mean, but he doesn't. He, really have, he doesn't have the Silmaril anyway. So it's I know, like, but if he really wanted the Silmaril, he would probably send somebody other than Baron to get it. Right? He would actually send somebody that he has faith in. Right. To retrieve it for him. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. He would send maybe a, a, a one of his Elvish warriors. You know, great Elvish warriors. Like an warrior. army of Elvish warriors. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah, he wouldn't just. Of course, that hasn't worked out for, well for him so far. Oh, for true. any of them so far. That's true. That's but of true. course, really, the Sindar haven't done much to help the Noldor, um, you know, in in resisting and attacking. Yeah, that's true. Morgoth either. Just so who knows? Who knows if they had helped? What what could have happened? But I yeah I I, I see your point and. I mean, Thingol does want a Silmaril. They the, all the elves want. Well, the Silmarils. yeah, everybody wants a Silmaril. Um, I just I don't think in this particular case he thinks there's a. A snowball's chance, and you know, in uh, in Angband, that you know he's gonna yeah. he's gonna actually deliver deliver on it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there you go. Um, quick time check. All right. So we know uh, we have the quest. The quest has been um, has been launched. Yep. Baron must go all the way to Angband and recover a Selmaril from the Iron Crown of Morgoth. Mm-hmm. Sounds pretty. Uh, sounds pretty doable. Yeah. It's all a day's work. It's all a day's work. Yeah. Um, and so Baron sets out on his own. He passes through Doriath unhindered and came at length to the region of the Twilight Mirrors and the Fens of Sirion. Right. So he goes west. If you look at your map in the back. All right. He's going out of Doriath. And um, and he goes into I'm sorry he actually goes southwest, right? So um, he kind of goes away from where he needs to ultimately, and goes down into the fens of Sirion, um, and eventually finds his way over to um, the highlands of Tar and Faroth that rose above Nargothrond. Nargothrond is of course mm-hmm. the home of. Fenroth Feligand, right? Yeah, Fenroth yeah, Feligand. Yeah. Um, the son of Fenarfin. One of the sons of Fenarfin. Make sure I get that right. Because I get all my Fs mixed up. Yep, that was right. The son of Fenarfin. Uh, and he shows up, and event- at first they're like, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? And he says, I am Baron, son of Barahir, friend of Feligand. Take me to the king. Um, so the hunters, the men who guard Nargothrond, Slew him not, but take him to see 
uh, take him to St. Fenrod. And there, um, he enlists the aid of Fenrod in going after the Silmaril. Right. Right. It is plain that, uh, I'm sorry, um, Felagund, when Baron tells him his mission, says, It is plain that Thingol desires your death. But it seems that this doom goes beyond his purpose and that the Oath of Feanor is, at work, is again at work. Can you just remind me, what was the Oath of Feanor? Uh, the Oath of Feanor is basically, like, no one no, no one will have the Silmarils except for Feanor and his sons. Right? Okay. Um, I can find it here. It's in chapter 9. That's okay. I knew it had something to do with the Silmarils. I just can't remember exactly what. Um... They swore an oath which none shall break and none should take by the name even of Iluvatar, calling the everlasting dark upon them if they swept, if they kept it not. And Manwe they named in witness, and Varda, and the hallowed mountain of Tanaquetl, vowing to pursue with vengeance and hatred to the ends of the world Vala, demon, elf, or man as yet unborn, or any creature, great or small, good or evil, that time should bring forth unto the end of days. Whoso should hold or take or keep a Silmaril from their possession." So why do people want them if they've been cursed like that? Um, the I don't think the Silmarils have been have been cursed, right? Well, then the but the um, okay the Silmarils, but the people who take the Silmarils uh-huh. or try to keep them have been cursed, right? Or is just saying that. Well, this is that's just the oath that Fanor and his sons okay. took, right? Okay. To say that like no one will have these but us. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so, uh, things and says, well, you know, here it says, for the Simrals are cursed with an oath of hatred, and he that even names them in desire moves a great power from slumber, and the sons of Fanor would lay all the elf kingdoms in ruin rather than suffer any other than themselves to win or possess the Silmaril, for the oath drives them. Yeah, well, I don't think they're cursed in the sense that like there's like some kind of magical curse upon them. Okay. I think it's just saying that there's been an oath sworn hmm. okay. about them, and so like they they have this kind of aura now uh, where if you so much as think about going after a Silmaril and the sons of Fanor get wind of it, you're in their sights now, right? Mm, okay. You're in their you're in their sights. Okay. So, um, but that brings us to Kelagorm and Kurafen, two of Fanor's sons, uh, who are dwelling in the halls of uh, Nargothrond. Right. They, like the rest, you know, they're they're powerful men, they're powerful elves, um, they're great lords, even though they're dwelling in the halls of Finarfin. Um, they have a strong power, they have a lot of pull in the realm. And um, uh, they have shown neither friendship to me in every need, but I fear that they will show neither love nor mercy to you if your quest be told. And so Fenrod says, yet my own oath holds, and thus we are all ensnared. Um, and so Felagan calls... Um, calls his people and says, hey, we need to go help um, Baron, the son of Bar here, fulfill this vow, right? Yep. Um, f- fulfill this mission. But Kelagorm uh, refuses to, right? He, he recalls the oath of the Fanor, of mm-hmm. Fanor, the oath he's bound up in, and says, I will not assist, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's somewhere else we alone claim until the world ends. Exactly. Um, and so there's this uh, discontent, and so ultimately, Kelagorm uh, and Kurafin um, convince many to stay behind, uh, and um, and it ends up pretty much just being Baron and Felagund who go on this who go on they this mission. Like ten others with them. Yeah, where does it say that? Let's see. Um... Yeah, you're right. There, there were ten, ten that stood by him, and the chief of them, who was named Edrahil, stooping, lifted the crown and asked that it be given to a steward until Felagan's return. For you remain my king and theirs, whatever betide. And he gives it to Oradreth, his brother, to govern in his stead. And Kelagorm and Corfin said nothing, but they smiled and went from the halls. So Kelagorm and Corfin are like, excellent. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, you know. Totally crazy. Yeah, they are. They're very... 
Very, very creepy. That's a good word. So Felagund and Baron uh, set out, go north from Nargothrond to um, to make their way to Angband. Mm-hmm. But first, because of geography, they have to pass by Tol Sirion, which Tol Sirion was in the last chapter, and it was uh, the location of that tower of Minas Tirith is that little oh, that little neck mm-hmm. right there where the mount mm-hmm. different mountain chains come together. Right. And so it's like the only pass on the western side of uh, of the the mountains of Dorthonion. Um, it's the only pass on the western side of the mount of those mountains. Um, in order to go the other way, you'd have to go way long way around, and it would take much longer. Uh, and you have to go through many different realms as well, which might get you into more trouble. Right. So they decide they have to go past Tol Sirion, and that, of course, means they're going to be meeting up with Sauron. Sauron and his tower was aware of them, and doubt took him. For they went in haste and stayed not to report their deeds, as was commanded to, uh, to all the servants Morgoth. Wait, Hold wait, on, so I'm sorry. They're, they're I'm sorry, that was, that's talking about the orcs. That, no, they're yeah, disguised as orcs, Go ahead, you're right. Orcs, right. You're right. Yeah. Okay, they're disguised as orcs. Um... By the arts of Felagan, mm-hmm. right? He basically changes them to look like orcs. Yes. So they could sneak through without being noticed. But Sarn, Sauron gets suspicious of them because they're not acting like normal orcs. Right. Right? They're not, like, reporting to him as they should. Mm-hmm. Right? And so he sends people out to get them. Right. And they... And so he he waylays them, and Sauron and Felgen join arms and sing a little ditty. Sing a little ditty. <laughs> For old time's sake. No, it's an epic rap battle, right? <laughs> it is an epic rap battle. It's a lip sync battle. That's right. Not lip sync. Uh, well, it could be. <laughs> I love you. You go and say, you went and said, and they sing a little song. Yeah. Well, I saw the poem there. I was like, oh yeah, didn't they like, they had like a duel, right? They had like a sing-off. It was a sing-off, that's what it was. They had a that's sing-off right. duel. That's right. Yeah. They Acapella. Had... Acapella style. Mm. Mm-hmm. For Felagan strove with Sauron in songs of power, and the power of the king was very great. But Sauron had the mastery, as is told in the Lay of Lithium. So I'll just pause here. Singer. I'll just pause here. Music, remember, oh, yeah, music, music is in the very fabric of mm-hmm. of the universe, of this universe, right? So um, there's something about the power of song, right? There's mm-hmm. something about songs. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a um, some kind of hidden power in it, you know, in, yeah. in this context. And so... So is this kind of like when... Um... Bilbo and Gollum had like that riddle contest. Was that kind of like what this was, but with song? Um, I mean, maybe a little bit, but. But what does that mean for Felagan strove with Sauron in songs of power? What does that mean to strove with someone in songs? Of, does that make literally mean they're having a sing off? I th- I think you need to be very careful about reading it, you know, through. So they're basically through like, like through like our like how we think of it in our modern culture, right? Okay. This is about um, you need to think of it in the context of music and the power and, and the fact that music is is the foundation of all reality in this universe in Tolkien's right. universe, okay. right? Okay. Okay. And so it's almost like summoning great elemental powers. It's it's like a it's almost like a oh, magic okay. contest, right? It's Got like it. okay. it's like a battle of magic of magicians okay. in a way, you know. Okay. Of wizardry. Yeah. Wizardry. Um, this isn't just guys it's fighting like, with swords, like warriors fighting with swords. This is like, you know, summoning these these powers, these invisible powers through song, right? It's like a Dumbledore and Snake thing. Con, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What what's that from? Yeah, whatever. Dumbledore and Dumbledore and Snoke. Ha, ha, ha. Who? You're not playing dumb very well. No. That's what happens when you get too smart? I'm playing. Play dumb. I'm not playing Dumbledore very well. <laughs> Come on, did you watch the Lego Movie? You know who they are. <laughs> Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Uh, <laughs> I don't watch that movie again now. <laughs> this is true because it rhymes. 
Was that it? Or we know this is true because it rhymes. It's all true because it rhymes. Dumbledore doesn't say that, but it's in the Lego movie, you're right. Yeah, I think it was actually, wasn't that like Gandalf or in the movie? Or no, it wasn't Gandalf. No, it was else. Gandalf wasn't in the movie. Yeah, he was. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah. I get Gandalf and Dumbledore mixed up. Yeah. Shame on me. I knew you were going to make that face. I know. It's the tall hats and the beards. <laughs> right now, John's Killing wondering, me how have I made it through 50 episodes with her? Killing me. I just tore my robes. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Fell to your knees. No! <laughs> You've learned nothing this whole time. No, I'm just trying. I'm big on mental pictures, and so I just remember that scene mm-hmm. from Harry Potter where Dumbledore and Snape are having their wand battle. That's um, how I picture this. I would picture it more like, you know, pi- I'm not saying I'm right about this. I'm just saying this is how I picture it okay. to make it seem a little cooler than like, you know, Broadway musical, like we're going to have a battle of song or something like a sing off or something like that, right? Um, this is more that. like, because that just totally like takes the mojo out of out of this stuff, you know, yeah. to think about it in those terms. I still like it though. I, <laughs> you, as long as you like it in your own head, that's fine with I me. Do. Okay. Um, and stop talking stop about polluting it. the rest of us <laughs> with that thought um, uh, as you can probably tell listeners at home I'm not a fan of Broadway and musicals and all that kind of stuff never been never never really gotten that whole thing missing out missing out yeah well I would just say think of this more in terms of like you know you gotta think of it more in terms of like wizards right like wizards battling like you know Shooting like yeah, huge shooting fireballs fire back at each other, but it's and... but you can't think of it as just fireballs, right? Like this is this is there's so many. It's like not not with like magic wands and stuff like that. Like, it's like with their fingers. It's like it's like they're just like they just they're just summoning things with the power okay. of their own beings, okay. right? Okay. So elves can do that. Apparently, I Who knew? again. Who knew? I mean, it's, this is a hard question to describe. Well, what does this look him, like? Because he, he doesn't go into it, you know, really heavily, right? Yeah, that's true. But, but also, but what do the songs consist of? They, you know, we'll, we'll just Song read this poem. Let's let's read the poem. Let's read the poem. You, you should have just done this in the first place. Okay, I'll start. Letters. You read it. Because I'm right. probably gonna mess up. No, I'll read it. Go. He chanted a song of wizardry. Oh, can I ask you one thing? Yeah. It's supposed to rhyme, right? Power, power, shape, yeah, but it rhymes, okay. This is true, because it rhymes. (laughs) This is true, because it rhymes. Speaking of rhyming poems, okay. He chanted a song of wizardry, of piercing, opening, of treachery, revealing, uncovering, betraying. Then sudden, Feligan, there swaying, sang an answer, a song of staying, resisting, battling against power, of secrets kept, strength like a tower, and trust unbroken, freedom escape, of changing and of shifting shape. Of snares eluded, broken traps, the prison opening, the chain that snaps. Backwards and forwards swayed their song, reeling and foundering as ever more strong. The chanting swelled, Feligan fought, and all the magic and might he brought, of Elvenes into his words. Softly in the gloom they heard the birds, singing afar in Nor- Norgathrond, the sighing of the sea beyond. Beyond the western world on sand, on sand of pearls in elven land. Then the gloom gathered, darkness growing, in Valinor the red blood flowing, beside the sea where the Noldor slew, the foam riders and stealing drew, their white ships with their white sails, from lamplit havens the winds wails, the wolf howls, the ravens flee, the ice mutters in the mouths of the sea, the captive sad and Angband mourn, thunder rumbles, the fires burn, and Finrod fell before the throne. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty... I, I think this is pretty fascinating because they're songs of power, but they're also songs of like of hope and despair, right? These are songs despair, that get yeah. in the mm-hmm. and and think about this too in terms of your own life, right? And like the way you know, kind of your own spirit and how in, in the different movements of your spirit during any given day, right? Or yeah. just over the course of your life, and how things can happen that just completely break your spirit, right? Yeah. Um, and and what is it that gets that finally gets Finrod? It's that the, the kinslaying. The kinslaying, right? Yeah. Which for Finrod, 
he's he's his identity is bound up in it, right? Because mm-hmm. he is part he's half Noldor, right. half Teleri, right. right? His mother was a Teleri. Mm-hmm. His father is is Finarfin, who is a Noldor, right? right. So um, this gets at the very fabric of of who Finrod is, and it and it causes him to despair and to lose. Um, you know, it's almost like Sauron saying, "You think you think you're better." You know than I am. You think you're you're morally superior to me, or something like that, mm-hmm. right? You're not, right? Yeah. And um, this is why. You come from this race of people that murder their own, yeah. you know, murder their own kin, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and and that causes Finrod to fall before the throne. Um, I mean, it's a really fascinating question. You know, this what are what does this song, battle of song look like? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and again contend that it's not like some Broadway sing off, right? It's well, it's a th- there's something much uh much more powerful yeah you know, no i get that this, i agree you know i agree yeah um i mean you, you know maybe you could look at it as like almost like presenting presenting their cases against one another right you know and and, and there may have been sword fights going on you know fights mm-hmm. going on too like re- you know mm-hmm. like wrestling and but there's also there's also this element of battling over over the truth, right? And yeah. over and over the story. Okay. Those are things people fight over today, you know? Yep. People fight, fight very hard over today. Yeah, true. Then Sauron stripped from, from them their disguise and they stood before him naked and afraid. But though their their kinds were revealed their kinds were revealed, Sauron could not discover their names or their purposes. So he cast them into a deep pit dark and silent, and threatened to slay them cruelly unless one would betray the truth to him. From time to time they saw two eyes kindled in the dark, and a, wer- and, a, and a werewolf devoured one of the companions, but none betrayed their lord. So, Sauron doesn't know who they are. Um, or why they're there. Right, and throws them into a dungeon. Yep. And that's where we're going to stop for this week. Yes. So, um, there's just so much in this in this chapter that we don't want to rush. You know, get get because there's a lot of really cool stuff that still happens. And, yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. Um, I mean, this we, may be three episodes. It, it may end up being three episodes. You never know. Um, I mean, I think I think a long episode for the next one we'll be able to get get through it. Yeah. Um, especially since we, you know we probably won't do haiku for the next one because we already did haiku probably. for the chapter. Yeah. Um, so we'll probably just jump right into discussion on the next one. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's our stopping point for now. So, Mm-mm-mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's so it's good. It's so good. It's so dense. It's There's so, so much in it. Good. Yeah, it is. I mean, I feel like I skipped over a bunch of stuff, too, that we could have talked more about. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do it justice, you know? Yeah. Because it's pretty much the coolest thing ever. Right. Right out. So, yeah. Well, good. I think that's a good place to uh, leave people hanging. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we will uh, we will pick it back up next week. And thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for spending some time. Yeah. With us and yeah. talking. You're on the Tolkien road. road. That's right. You know we are. Uh, we're not too far from the end of this whole. I know. We're more than halfway, aren't we? Getting there. Although there's some long. So there's this chapter that's long, and then there's. Um. The the next one is not not super long. It's it's a kind of a normal length for one of the chapters, and then and then of Tour and Tour and Bar is really long again, and then it's a couple of more shorter chapters, um, three more shorter chapters after that. So okay. I expect of Tour and Tour and Bar will take us probably two episodes okay. as well. But anyway, all right, just that well, one. All right. Yeah. Party on. Party on. We will talk at you next time. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show. It takes less than a minute. On the next episode, we'll continue and hopefully finish our discussion of Baron and Luthien. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.